Hello and welcome to the Life After Diets podcast. I'm Sarah Dosanj, psychotherapist and author of the book, I Can't Stop Eating. And I'm Stephanie Michelle, binge recovery health coach. If you feel out of control around food, we get it because we've been there. Thank you for joining our conversations about how to make peace with food and feel more comfortable in our bodies. Now on to this week's episode. Hi, Steph. Hi, Sarah. How's my favorite septic? Septic? Mm-hmm. What's that? I've never heard that term before. No. It's a it's a it's a it's a little nickname for an American. <laughs> a septic? Yeah, it's like a septic tank. Yeah. That's all I hear. That's, that's what like it a, is. That's like, a, that's like a toilet bowl. I know, but it's it's cockney rhyming slang. Septic tank is yank. Mm. My favorite <laughs> septic. Yeah, I would say so. That's wonderful. Um I'm well. I'm a, I'm a little silly today. I don't know where this is coming from. For you. I don't know. Were you being silly? Are you trying to uh, sabotage the podcast? No, absolutely not. <laughs> that wouldn't sabotage. I'm usually so serious. Um, no, but did you like that smooth segue into the topic of the you podcast? You always do that. I don't like this topic. Well, I do. I do like the topic as a concept, but you know, I don't like the word. But people use it a lot, right? Yes. I, I know. I get it. Let's did, dive in. Yeah. Did you used to use it? Do you? Yes, I did. You used to think that what you were doing was self-sabotage. Yes. In what ways did you feel like you were self-sabotaging at the time when you thought you were self-sabotaging, even though now you don't think it was (laughs) self-sabotage? Well, when you put it like that. um, Yeah. So I would wake up with such good intentions and I felt that they were, those intentions were meant to like help me heal, help me to be happier, help me to be healthier, help me be normal. And then I would like wake up. And go downstairs and binge. First thing. I mean, what else would I think? I just must have something inside of me that wants me to fail and wants to keep me here and will not work with myself. I had conversations with therapists and with my mom. I think I've mentioned that, you know, she said, why do you self-sabotage? Why do you self-sabotage? That was very much a concept that I identified with for a long, long time. You know what else it was? I would have plans to go out to dinner or to something I really actually wanted to go to. And then hours leading up to it, I would binge and then wouldn't go. And it would be this way that I got in my own way and was like, I must not want good things for myself because I get in my own way. I make it so that I won't go. Um, So that was another example of how that looked. Well, that's how self-sabotage is normally spoken about, isn't it? It's this idea that there's part of us that doesn't want us to succeed that's not necessarily conscious, that then unconsciously or semi-consciously gets in the way. Do you buy that? Yes. When you're talking about parts, when I was thinking about self-sabotage, then I did not recognize that there was a subconscious part of me that didn't want those things or that didn't want to go or that didn't want to eat well. Like to me, it was like, no, I do because my consciousness was all identified as myself. So I, I didn't see that there were parts And I think that's what I think typically that is how it's thought about, that there's this like, why would I do this? There's this lack of understanding, like, why would I? And I think that the answer is more simply, there is a part of you that that doesn't want those things or or that wants to do this other thing. But I think it's hard for us to see that. And we're like, why would I want that? Why would I want, you know, in a way, when you're talking about that part of you, that part of you is not sabotaging anything. That part of you is getting just what it wants. Um, So. That's why the word is a bit tricky because it's not entirely a sabotage. It's actually in your service it's just in, for a part of you. The brain, when it can't make sense of why we're doing something, what I seeing tends to happen is then the conclusion it comes to is, oh, there's just something wrong with me. So it must be because actually I, I don't believe I'm worth it. Or actually it's just because there's part of me that's so destructive and wants to act out or I'm undisciplined or I'm weak or all the stories I think that tend to come in to try to explain why it is we seem to sometimes act not in accordance with our best interests. And you'll say there, okay, well, there's a part of you that is helping. Is that always true, do you think? Yes, I think that there's a part of there's a there's some part that it's in service of. Sometimes that part is very short sighted, but it's serving a purpose for that moment. 
and it, or it's speaking up. So for example, part of my binges felt really rebellious. They felt like a big get out of my way. I'm going to do what I want. I will not be, I, I don't, it was just a big like middle finger to the, you know, that's how it felt. And I didn't have any consciousness about that. But there was a part of me that got really validated by being a rebel. It was anger expression. And there was a real need for me to be expressing anger. I just was not in touch with the anger. So I had no idea why it was happening. I couldn't understand it. But now I'm like, I was angry. I was really angry. And that part of me served that anger. Was that helpful to me overall? Yet I would argue both. There were ways that got that got in my way and it was misguided anger. But it was it was a way that it was something in me was seen and given room that I wasn't otherwise giving room. I sometimes think of it, and this isn't, isn't going to apply in every case, but there's something going on around trying to reconcile something old. Mm. If we took it as a belief that somebody might have about themselves, maybe looking at people who get into cycles of just taking it away from food for a moment into abusive relationships have this belief that this is what always happens in relationships and then their behavior seems to act in a way to make that more likely to happen through choices that they make through situations they find themselves in so one of the ways that I think about self-sabotage as such is if it feels like a cycle that I've been going around again and again and I get to that point where I'm like, how did I end up at this point again how did I end up here when I've turned it around and asked it as a question to myself I'll ask it something along the lines of, well, what is life trying to teach me? What is it that's stuck here? And I've spoken about this before in terms of binge eating recovery. Sometimes I'll say to people, what is it you need to learn in order to be able to stop this behavior? Right. Like that's part of its purpose. Yeah. And so maybe self-sabotage is sometimes reaffirming this identity. If you believe like right in your cells that you are unworthy or you are too much your behavior is likely to drive you in certain situations to make the outcome more likely to reinforce that belief this is why i think getting rid of the shame part is needs to be one of the first things we do when it comes to healing our relationship with food and our bodies because for as long as we have this shame story that there's something really wrong with us our behavior is going to keep taking us down that path, even if we're practicing all these new beliefs, trying to hold on to these new ways of thinking and being. Yeah. I thought you were going to say, get rid of the shame part because it allows the curiosity to come in. Because if we're not feeling ashamed of even the sabotage piece, we can understand maybe where it's coming from and, and why it exists. That too. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you meant both. I certainly did, very much so. I just wanted to give you a chance to say stuff to you. Because <laughs> re I'm really quiet on this podcast, you know. Exactly. I'm just trying to give you a bit of air time. <laughs> <laughs> How have you self-sabotaged? Or do you? Do you still do that in any way? The longest time I had this belief that I didn't stick at anything and I was inconsistent. And I would get excited about some new project I was going to do some new way of eating, some new way of exercising, whatever it might have been. And then always finding myself back at that same place. And I think there was something about learning how to be consistent for consistency's sake, which is how I started with the really, really small stuff. And I think for me, actually, my self-sabotage was probably playing out, if I can make it as simple as possible, with just the black and white thinking going on. I had this idea in my head that this is how it was supposed to be. And when it wasn't, I was very quick to throw my hands up in the air and go, well, like, this isn't how I wanted it to be. And I knew I'd never be able to do this. And I would catastrophize and spiral. And I suppose in that catastrophization, I take myself back to the beginning, back to the original belief of I'm not consistent. I don't stick at anything. And all of yeah. that story about myself. Can I ask, though? Hmm. What did having either the black and white thinking or the catastrophizing or the belief that you weren't good at anything, how did that serve you? Was that supporting something? I think it gave me permission to just collapse and not keep pushing. Did you need to do that? I don't think I would have allowed myself to have right. just rested and stopped. Right. That's why I think that's what the self-sabotage does. That, that's what it's saying. Like, hey, totally. I, I, I think that's a lot of my depression self-sabotage was. I looked at it like self-sabotage, but it was like, I need to stop. 
I need to give myself permission that I'm not able to give myself. It's really interesting because as you were saying that part of me was going, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. And then there was this little voice in my head was saying, mm, was that just an excuse? <laughs> <laughs> and I just heard it and I was like, huh, I'm going to say you out loud on the podcast. <laughs> Take your power away. <laughs> oh, look at that. <laughs> look at that. Human. Yeah. I think as well, it was trying to point out to me that my expectations were not realistic as well. I had this idea that I should just be able to decide how I'm going to think and feel and how I'm going to behave and then just do it. And I, I, I recognize that in others as well. I see that I'm not the only one doing that out there. Yeah. Anyone listening, if it's you. <laughs> if it's you. <laughs> There's also part of, I think, sometimes eating disorders that serve the purpose of saying I'm not well, I need help. Um, and this is th these cases, I think wherever we're talking about self-sabotage, it's important to look at the the multifaceted goals that our parts have. So I do believe there's room for both. There's room for this is not helping me. And there is room for this is helping me <laughs> at the same time that there's both that there's two goals. It's sometimes a voice, I think. Sometimes I, I always talk about binges as being some kind of voice, some kind of it's saying something. Uh, something that I'll ask clients to do a lot is to journal about if your binges were speaking out loud, what would they be saying at the same time as that can be destructing. And I think it's interesting that you brought up the thing about the past. I'm not sure if this is the way you meant it, but I do resonate when you said it. I really resonated with it, like that sometimes these feelings are older, they're collected, they build. I think that's part of emotional like the body keeps the score kind of stuff, like where things have happened again enough to and we're, we reached such a threshold of being able to hold this inside without speaking about it or without expressing it somehow or without validating it even to ourselves that eventually it manifests in through food as one way. I mean, it's not the only way that that might manifest, but it has its own history of what the, of what it's there for and what it's trying to do that doesn't necessarily have to do with our present moment goals. Yeah. So something that I've been reflecting on recently is, so I'm single and I have been doing some dating recently and I noticed that each time I went on a date or a couple of dates with somebody and then for whatever reason decided not to pursue that, there was a real sense of relief of like finding out, oh, it's okay. Actually, this person, you know, then we're not a good fit because of X, Y, Z. And then there's a relief. And I see this with some of my other friends who are dating as well, almost looking for reasons for somebody not to be right and experiencing that sense of relief in that, which feels kind of at conflict to the idea of dating and looking for a relationship. And it's only recently that I've been thinking to myself and really trying to be as honest with myself as I can be, which is partly why I'm a bit reluctant to sit on the podcast because I don't know how self-aware I am yet about this. But there's a part of me that's going, I'm really not sure that I want a relationship. And is that okay to not want a relationship? Because there's this idea that that's part of what we should want. And then that questioning, or am I just saying to myself that I don't want a relationship because there's fear or I don't want to be vulnerable or whatever it might be. And those two sides kind of in opposition because I'm not quite sure which side it is. So when I'm on one side, it can almost look like self-sabotage to be looking for reasons to not go down this path and on the other side I'm thinking well maybe part of it is I don't actually want to go down that path but what are my reasons for not wanting to go down that path and am I okay with those reasons for not wanting to go down that path taking off the social pressures of what it means to be in a relationship or not be in a relationship so I think sometimes this self-sabotage I wouldn't really use this word but it's what came to mind when we were having this conversation is about a conflict a conflict between two parts so whichever part seems the biggest and most active most of the time might feel like that's the part that keeps being sabotaged by this other part that just sparks up now and again or vice versa and yeah. how I'm really in this crux at the moment where I'm looking at it and going I don't know I really don't know one day I'm like yeah maybe and another day I'm like oh, maybe not then I'm like, oh, is this ambivalence, some attachment issues going on here? And all of that starts coming yeah. in as well. Mm -hmm. And yeah, just interesting watching my behavior and trying to understand why I might be looking for something. And then when I don't find it, experiencing relief. Yeah. 
You know, a litmus test might be mm. don't pursue dating and see if you self-sabotage it. <laughs> <laughs> I've definitely done that as well. But, and that is where I'm at at the moment. I think I'm just going to take a step back from actively dating for a bit and just kind of gather myself and yeah, see how I feel. What's interesting about relationships is that you may have two parts that one, sometimes you want a relationship and sometimes you don't, but we don't, you can't, it doesn't really work. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I was thinking another example of self-sabotage is, I don't know if you've ever done this, if this was like a body image thing for you, but I would have an event to go to. I mean, not a huge event. It could be a big, it could be a wedding. It could be a dinner out. <clears throat> and I would have nothing to wear because I was like, I just avoided all my clothes and I would just know that I needed something to wear um, to be comfortable. And it was important that I had something that I was somewhat comfortable in knowing the importance of that and knowing I should go shopping. And I would literally, I would just keep putting it off, putting it off until the day of the event when I'd be like, I never went shopping. And now I, cause I would be like, oh, whatever, I'll just wear whatever in my closet. And I would get to my closet and be like, nothing in here works. Like you knew that. And I would get so angry at myself because I was like, why would you do, why would you set yourself up so that you now have to attend this event in clothes that do not work, that now you're going to be even more self-conscious in because it's a spring dress in the winter, you know, or, well, or the fall or something, you know, it was like, it didn't go and it, and it didn't fit right. And it was like, I would st suffer through. It. And I used to do that all the time. Um, like not be prepared for something and call that self-sabotage, but that was in service of the part of me that didn't want to go shopping and didn't want to be triggered by shopping. Again, that short-sightedness, I can't see the forest through the trees. Like, why would you set yourself up for that? You're just too lazy to go shopping. I would say that. Um, you're too flighty. Flighty is that word that comes up and like that there's some part of me that wasn't responsible enough to understand the long-term consequences of things. But I... I think I was just serving my day to day and it was just kind of like, I just need to survive today and going shopping is really triggering to me. So I choose to get through today and I'll deal with the consequences later. And I think I was willing to do that. And then the later would come and it would be like, what? That doesn't make any sense. But it was, it was that, that one came up so much and it kind of sometimes still does <laughs> where I don't feel like it. And I just like, but I think it is serving and not necessarily in clothing, but like where I, I just there's certain things I just don't want to do. And then it comes time. I'm like, oh, darn it. I should have really prepared for that. I had such a funny obsession with time and getting things done that that wouldn't be my experience. <laughs> You're looking at me like, yeah, no. <laughs> I'm, I'm, you know, I, but I, I, yeah, I, I think that will be relatable to a lot of people, but that's not, that's not the, one of mine. If it means something to me, I will. And I'm very type A about that. But if but if there's something, I think it's also speaking up for a side of me, too, that is like, don't make me do what I don't want to do. That's old. That's old for me. And there's so much <laughs> about that that is not yet. Pro I mean, I process a lot of that, but there's still I think it's just in there still. Right. There's this whole don't make me do it. I don't want to. And that is not really what my current self believes about myself. I don't feel like I pressure myself to do things that I don't want to do anymore. But I used to. That was a hole for me. You know, I would always reject myself in service of what someone else wanted of me. And that's that's what that self-sabotage also is potentially doing is saying like you will not do you will not be forced to do unless it's your decision and I guess there's more work to do there around okay this is your decision <laughs> like you want to go to this wedding and you know maybe some self-talk would have been appropriate in those times and still probably would be sometimes but but because we're on autopilot most of the time and it's not that much of an issue to me um anymore um and that's that's not a bad part of me you know what I mean? Like it's an inconvenient part of me sometimes, but it's, it's looking out for me, you know? And, and I think that that's part of the self-compassion that we can have towards our self-sabotage is like, no, it's fighting for you in some way. Um, it may need to be updated and, ha and talk to, <laughs> but it's, it's, it's impulse is valid. I think the trap I fall into, and I would call it a trap more than self-sabotage is about taking too many things on trying to do too many things at once and that might come back to having expectations that I should be able to do all these things I'd spoken to you and I think in the community maybe not on the podcast about the retreat I went on at the beginning of September and I came away from that retreat just feeling like none of my problems will ever be problems again 
And I kind of floated through the next couple of weeks. And even as reality just started to feel a bit more like reality again, there was that real sense of calmness that felt like it was unshakable. And it's probably only been in the last couple of weeks that I have experienced a feeling of overwhelm again. That feeling was foreign to me. It didn't even make sense. I never thought I could feel overwhelmed again. Turned out that wasn't correct. And it's just everything building up. And so it builds up to a head. And then that I have to deal with that feeling of overwhelm, which again, doesn't feel like self-sabotage. I think because when we're talking about different parts, wanting different things, and I feel so, so much more accepting of the different parts of myself than I've ever felt before. That yes, it can be uncomfortable and one part is trying to be heard. The part that's feeling overwhelmed is trying to say to me, Sarah, Sarah, something has to give. There's some things that need to be oh, yeah. pushed back or let go of or not now or refocus or reprioritize or whatever it might be. So I think that maybe self-sabotage becomes less, I don't know, intense and confusing when we take a little bit of time to listen to the different parts of ourselves, to listen to the yeah. discomfort, we get better at perhaps at catching the warning signs because otherwise this overwhelm, if it continued, then I would probably collapse into a depression because I think right. that's what right. my bouts of depression have often been about. It's about that yes. needing to collapse. But if I pay closer attention to the overwhelm now, yeah. I'm feeling very hopeful that that's not going to take me back to that place. Yeah, and this really ties in with the importance of and why we've done episodes on sitting with processing, feeling your feelings and emotions, because that's the part that needs validation, right? It's like that part of you that's like, I'm feeling, you know, to my example, I'm feeling, what's the word for made to do what you don't want to do? I'm feeling pressured. I'm feeling pressured. Yeah. And perhaps even oppressed in a way. Or I'm being silenced. I'm not being considered. You know, this, this, this is the message. So. I plant my feet and my heels in the ground. I'm like, I'm not going, I'm not doing it, <laughs> you know? But if I stop me, like, what is this feeling I'm having? Um, same could be said for binges, right? Like you walk downstairs and yet you start binging, even though you have every intention to honor and respect your body and listen to your body today, right? I mean, the binges come anyway. And you're just like, what is this? What's under it? What's the emotion that's driving this today? And it's hard. I, I think it's hard to know. I think that's its own process of figuring out how do I hear it? How do I know what that is? And then validating it. I think that there's so much, I think it's when you're talking about the feeling of something older speaking up, I think it's partly a concept of inner child, that there's something in there that's, that is a bit impulsive and short-sighted and just emotion, purely emotional without rational logic and, and foresight. That's kind of just needing to be heard. And how long has it been not heard? So it's like, you know, I, I read a lot now of like conscious parenting um, because so much of that is so much of this. And there's this idea of like, okay, when my child is having a tantrum and I am completely overwhelmed and all I want to do is be like, go to your room. Like I am like so overwhelmed by that. It's kind of like, okay, meeting the child and being like, I, I know that you are upset. What's going on? What's, what's creating that? This is something that's so hard to do, by the way, but like, only because we're on, you're dealing with your own sense of, oh, enough. <laughs> but that, that validation that perhaps was never met, you know, the parts of us that were never seen, the parts of us that swallowed a lot of things and never spoke up. And so there is this inner child, if you could call it that, that has this need for, I see you, I can name you. I know what this is and I'm here to listen to it. That may over time start to influence the need to be binging or to be not going shopping before you have a wedding to go to or whatever it might be. And I think that attending to it rather than demonizing it and being like, oh, I'm binged again. I did this again. I'm, I'm such a jerk, you know, is not getting to the heart of why that exists. I was thinking of that term acting out, mm -hmm. you know, how kids can act out when there's troubles going on at home and there's nowhere for them to or no way for them to understand and comprehend what's going on. So I'm thinking about the type of sabotage that seems like our behavior is really acting out in a way. Do you think it's possible that that is all, most of the time, all down to being unable to process or acknowledge some kind of emotional experience? Yes, or that it's not that you are acknowledging it and it's not getting met. There's some need not getting met. 
you might have awareness about it and you may try to work on your own behalf, but it may not be getting validated even then. I see that sometimes. Why? What else are you thinking about? <laughs> Not oh. <them. laughs> I just thought that we were just about to um, figure this whole thing out. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to leave that in. <laughs> Don't take that out. Um, I'll Google it. Okay. I think self-sabotage can also be confirmation bias. When you do have that belief about yourself and your actions just go stand to prove it. Mm -hmm. You were sort of alluding to that earlier. Yeah. Having a look on Google, there's a few ways people are talking about it. And one place it's saying the term self-sabotage is used when this destructive behavior is directed at yourself. At first, you may not even notice you're doing it. But when negative habits consistently undermine your efforts, they can be considered a form of psychological harm. What do you make of that? Same, sure, to one part of you. But it's assuming uh, that it's destructive. It's yeah, really, it, it's only a negative thing. It also says here, self-sabotage is when people do or don't do things that block their successes or prevent them from accomplishing their goals. Sure. But the goal is is one part of you. And it might be the conscious part and the most predominant part and the most present current moment part but not there's another part that it's serving that's trying to speak if you want connection and support around any of the topics we talk about on the podcast we would love for you to join our membership community members have access to monthly online support groups a private facebook group live episode recordings and member only q and a's if you would like to join us please head to lifeafterdietspodcast.com forward slash community now let's get back to the episode have you ever heard that Marianne Williams quote saying something along the lines of we're not we're not really afraid that we're actually unworthy we're like scared of how great we actually are have you heard that mm -hmm. one it's something along those lines that's not the right word I've heard some I don't know if it's hers but I've yeah I've heard the concept what do you make of that 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 idea that there's a fear of success yeah that's sometimes spoken to in the in the yeah. self sabotage world <laughs> sure Yes. Not always, but yes, I can absolutely, uh, I can relate to that. Why do you think you've been scared of success or doing well or good things? This, this, uh, I'm immediately transported back to like 1999. I'm sitting in my therapist's office and he suggests this to me for the first time. He said, are you actually, we, all we talked about was how I hated myself. That's all we talked about. I loved this therapist, by the way. Um, and he said, are you really afraid of your own power? And by power, he meant success. And I knew what he meant by it. And then we related it to like my dad um, and his power and all the ways that he had been successful and all the ways that I was trying not to be like him um, or to speak up for the part of me that had been oppressed by that power. Um, oppressed or influenced in a way that I wasn't comfortable with with that and the parts of that that I wanted to reject. So that concept to me was very early on suggested and I felt it was true. As soon as he said it, I said, like, I got it. Um, and I've thought of it. I, I mean, I don't think it's been as relevant. Maybe because he named it, you know, like he said it to me and I saw it then. And then it was kind of like, thank you for naming it. Thank you for validating that for me. Thank you for witnessing that. Um, and now I may be free to move on and not let that be part of my story anymore. You know what I mean? And I think that's exactly what I mean. It's it's like this. We need that. We need that part of us to be seen, even if it's just by what somebody else witnessing it. And I think that's why us naming something can be powerful. It's why I love language for things, because then maybe we can set ourselves free from needing to prove it. You know, it's reminding me of something a therapist said to me very early on in therapy where I was complaining about all these traits that I had that I saw in my dad so I felt like I had these traits of his and I couldn't understand why I'd inherited all these what I saw as not great traits and she said to me she said well Sarah we tend to only notice the things that get in the way and it's a really quite a benign comment that doesn't sound that uh, deep or anything but it really hit me it was one of those moments in therapy where I was like that's so true 
And I've come to realize that there are so many aspects that I've inherited from my dad's side that have been really helpful qualities in yeah. going forward and doing what I'm doing. And I was only noticing the yeah. things that I was seeing reflected of myself in him. I was going, I don't want to be like that. Yes. Yes. I relate to that so much. <laughs> Hi, dad. <laughs> hey, dad. <laughs> Love you, dad. <laughs> Sometimes wonder if he listens. I don't know if he does. I don't think my dad does. I don't think he'd want to. I do love my dad and that my dad has wonderful traits. Um, it's been a journey of uh, seeing them both, you know? Yeah, same here, same here. I don't think we can talk about self-sabotage, though, without talking about weight loss and this idea of self-sabotaging okay. weight loss efforts. That that moment, let's use a classic example that you and I have probably both had and both seen many times. You step on the scale, lost more weight than you thought maybe that you were going to have, feel great for a moment, and then that seems <laughs> to tip into yeah. some kind of out of control eating or binge. Yes, 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 yes. Well, I think it's important there. And first thing coming up for me is like, what is my fear of losing weight? <clears throat> which there was, <clears throat> which I never would have been conscious of, but I had fears around it. There was a part of that that felt unsafe to me. Because if I lost weight, number one, there was the expectation I had to maintain it, which was somebody else telling me what to do. And there was also a feeling of being more seen. And I didn't want to be, at least there was a part of me that didn't want to be. I think for me, only the couple of times when it happened to me, my mind actually went more to a, well, I deserve it. Mm -hmm. I've worked this hard, so I deserve whatever so it was I wanted to eat. So then I would eat the thing and then I would feel bad about eating the thing. And then the all or nothing thinking would kick in and then it would turn into a binge at that point. It wouldn't be, oh, I deserve a binge because right. I was never thinking that. But I'd be thinking, oh, I deserve to have this. And then I would have it and just lose control with it. Right. Yeah. I think there's camps with that, that whole I deserve it thing. That never would have crossed my mind. Mm -hmm. But I know how, how frequent that comes up. Well, and what that's our cases are different. So in my case, there's a belief, there's a hidden belief going on. And in yours, it's I think what would often happen is I would start overthinking my food choices again. Mm. Especially if I hadn't really been restricting, but I'd just been what I would have called being good. Lost a bit of weight. And then my mind would be overthinking everything, thinking, oh, I've got to get back on this. So I think it would also kick off a bit more restrictive thinking. It would be like, well, I've lost this much, so yeah. how do I push it more? It was always that pushing for more, pushing for more. So that would be going on in conflict with this part of me that's going, well, you've done so well. You deserve to reward yourself. Yeah, yeah. I think these things are at play a lot more than we think about, right? I think on the surface, it just looks like we're doing ourselves in. But I think that there's such a domino effect, you know, with with when it comes to weight loss, bodies, eating, you know, food, binging, that there's so many, there's so many other things to, to look at here that are also going on that makes this more complicated and makes it more understandable. I think being able to see all of that is so helpful to taking shame out of it and to, to just being able to look at it with curiosity, like, you know, okay, oh, like that makes sense to me, why, why that all happened, rather than it being a case of I just, I just, I'm bad. Yeah. And if at the time anyone had dared to suggest to me that any part of me thought there was any downside to losing weight, I would not yeah. have been willing to listen. But looking at all the potential parts of somebody that might not want to lose weight, you've got one from a biochemical standpoint, the body may feel threatened by that. There's the attention that comes from people, the commenting and people asking what you've been doing. And if you, especially if you've got an eating disorder or just really struggling with food, somebody asking you what it is you're eating and how you're eating in order to get to that point and having to have those kinds of conversations or try and avoid those conversations, being told how great you look and you feel like you're hanging on by a thread and the thought of you're going to end up going back anyway or fear that you might go back and or that belief or they're saying I look good now so they must have thought I looked terrible before that one comes up a lot being more visible from a sexual desirability point of view as well that can be very threatening for people if you've had a parent that or some kind of person in your life has been quite controlling and they really want you to lose weight you start losing weight the threat that somehow 
this isn't always a rational one, but they're somehow winning because they're getting what they want and it's been such a battle of wills. Oh, just to name yeah. a couple off the top just of my head. Couple, boom. I'm putting that as the Instagram reel. <laughs> <laughs> I also want to speak to people who may feel like all this introspection is hard work, is annoying, is frustrating and all of that. I was having a conversation with a friend of mine the other day. We were having a conversation about um, knowing who we are and taking time to be all this kind of introspective work that we're talking about here. And she said to me, I just think life is too short to be so introspective. And I thought, I feel like life is too short not to be. So <laughs> it's like we had the same thought about life being short and just came yeah. to completely opposite That's conclusions so interesting. about what that means. <laughs> I, all of that stuff, it, I love it. It makes me enjoy my life more to think about it and to, to see things and how they work. It's fascinating to me. But maybe it doesn't float everybody's boat. I don't want to listen to this podcast anymore. Maybe <laughs> yeah. give us three stars. <laughs> <laughs> if you want yeah. to talk to more people, though, that like introspection and like self-work and yada yada, you might want to come to our live event slash workshop in January on the 28th of January in London. I mean, maybe. Yeah. It's getting on a plane. She's coming to London. We're going to be in the same room together. And if you relate to this self-sabotage stuff, the, the event we're going to be doing some work around the inner critic, how to manage your inner critic, how to tame that inner critic, because that is at the core of a lot of this work, I would say. So if you really relate to this idea of self-sabotage and having an inner critic and you want to come and meet us, check out the notes below, book a ticket, come see us. We'd love <laughs> to hang out with you. We so could have done a better job at plugging that. <laughs> I know. I think we're just awkward about plugging ourselves. Okay. We'll get it better for next episode. I'm going to take a pee break and then we'll write the blurb. Is that how we're ending it? <laughs> oh, I thought we ended it. <laughs> I we said goodbye. It is now. Bye, Stop everyone. Recording. That's going to go and pee. <laughs> so the ending. <laughs> I, I stopped recording. I thought that we were done. <laughs>